Project Sapient is a podcast meant to engage our brothers and sisters in the law enforcement and military communities in conversations that we all know we need to have. All opinions you hear are our own, and they are protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. They are in no way reflect or meant to reflect the opinion of any specific agency, officer, or service member. Some opinions may be controversial. The center discretion is advised. Enjoy. <laughs> It's uh, been quite the busy, busy last couple of weeks. I know I haven't really been doing the weekly episodes. Just it's been wild in the world of law enforcement lately. Just really the amount of work that's out there and the amount of things that are going on. It's, it's yeah, it's 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 been busy. But so I this episode, I think you guys will know who this is. We brought him on one of our first you know episodes. And uh, he wrote a new book, so I wanted him to come back, come back, talk about his new book, and and talk about some of the things that contained within the book. So, everyone, please welcome Mike Malpass back to the show. Hey, Mike. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, no, no, appreciate appreciate you, dude. Just following you and on your LinkedIn and stuff like that. Some of the, I mean. You know, me and you kind of think the same same wavelength when it comes to the neuroscience of training and stuff like that. And it's it's really cool to see you on the West Coast side, really pushing and 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 you know challenging the the she'll call it the modern training curriculum <laughs> that's out there that you and I both know just does not work. And you know, I when you announced that you've got a new book. Said, of course, I'm going to get Mike's new book. I need to see what else, you know, what what what's this book about? And put it right on up on the camera. It's called Tenacious Resilience. So there you go. There you have it. Tenacious Resilience. For those of you who haven't actually got his other book, Taming the Serpent: How Neuroscience Can Revolutionize Modern Law Enforcement Training, you're missing out. Missing out on a lot of great information from Mike. I mean. You know, I'll give you guys a quick bio and then and then we'll get going. So Michael Malpass is a retired police officer with 30 years of experience, 11 and a half of those years with the SWAT team in Phoenix, Arizona. Mike's the author of two previous books, Taming the Serpent and Fall 7, Rise 8. And now his third book, obviously, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's got that going. And uh, both uh, for those uh, books, the two I just announced or talked about, both those books were geared towards law enforcement training and this book, this is his first work applying lessons from law enforcement and as a competitive fighter with a study of neuroscience as it applies to performance. And, you know, I just find it very, you know, just amazing on the amount of science that's out there and with the neuroscience and neurophysiology and stress responses that none of it ever gets brought up in the law enforcement world. It's starting to, I'm starting to see little articles here and there, police one and whatever. I mean, they're, they're starting to talk about it, but to, you know, to me, it's, it's one of those things that should have been talked about forever, you know, since this profession began, you know, just, just to talk about that and get people to understand that in the end, you know, as law enforcement officers, we're human. So Mike, I'm going to start you right off. So why, why this book, why this new book, the tenacious resilience, what kind of got you to uh, start you know, thinking about it. I, I, the, the first books were specifically for law enforcement. But then even when I wrote those books, I was kind of taken and comparing competitive fight training in the different disciplines, boxing, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, and then, and then law enforcement training, and then comparing that to the different types of SWAT training and stuff. And then I, I had become familiar with Carl Friston and Mark Soames' work about the free energy principle. And, the, and my thought then became, well, if, if you look at athletic performance, if you look at 
law enforcement performance, how does it relate to just plain peak performance and no matter what you're doing, whether it's a cerebral exercise, whether it's a physical exercise or a combination of those, what things link all of that together? And then would that be information that was useful to anyone who wanted to perform at their best when it mattered the most to them? And what I found was at the same time I was uh, learning about the free energy principle and how it affect, how it related to effective neuroscience, all of this research came out about tenacity and resilience. And then it, it kind of clicked. Something like got a light bulb moment where you're like, okay, so one of the things that everyone has at that peak performance level is higher levels of tenacity and resilience. So what is the physiology of that? And then how does that relate to that free energy principle, effective predictive neuroscience? And could that help people? I, I think w- what you'll find about the brain is the number one thing the brain does is reduces uncertainty. The brain does not like surprise or uncertainty. So the goal of the brain is to reduce uncertainty. But in order to do that, it has to deal with a lot of variability in your life. If you're dealing with other human beings, there's going to be variability. If you're not used to the idea and you just expect everything to go your way, that's average performance. Average performance is you can do pretty good when everything goes the way it's supposed to. Peak performance is what happens when variability, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity just jump on your back. And peak performers are the people who can deal with that variability. They understand that uncertainty is part of the equation and that working your way through uncertainty is what peak performance is. So that's kind of the idea behind the book was how do you develop that? How do you train for that uncertainty, that variability that's going to hit? And then how do you attach that volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity into your training so that if the brain is a predictive mechanism, you want your brain to predict Yes, this is uncertainty, but we're pretty darn good at dealing with uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I want to kind of take it a little bit back more that, you know, it's it's one of those things with, with peak performance. Funny, I was, I was actually talking to a, a neurophysiologist friend of mine, and we were talking about, you know, peak performance and, and stuff like that and, and how athletes, such as, you know, some of the greatest athletes in the world, right, whether it's boxing, football, whatever, and how they live off that peak performance, right? It may not be perfect for that day, or they might be having a bad bad game or even bad practice, but you see that there's no giving up in them, though, they, because they know what's at stake, or they know, they understand that part of, you know, the, 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 the physiology where in order to get good at something, you're going to be bad anyway, you know, at it. You know, and you got to keep working and striving for to get better at that whatever specific thing that that you're thinking of, and and it just turned into I don't know if you probably agree with this, but lately or or for the past several years, it's turned into this need for instant gratification, where it doesn't matter how many years it it would take you to be an expert marksman or a a a you know gray cop or firefighter or even just you know doctor whatever whatever profession it might be it, it's all of a sudden turning into this you know well i need to get there yesterday well that's not the way it works you know you got to work your ass off in order to get your to your goal so so one thing is you know i saw on on your book you know you open up right right with the acknowledgments and i love the theodore roosevelt quote you know the his, part of his speech and it's not the critic who counts not the man who points out how uh, the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings. And and that's like, I'll, I'll stop right there. That's it right there. I think that's the bulk of it right there. And and you even write, you know, I, I like that at the end. This book is dedicated to anyone who chooses not to be a cold and timid soul. I, I like that because it 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 create because it to me it, we've created or society has created this sort of well, stay comfortable, right? Don't don't work too hard. You get stressed too much, you know. Let's let's you know take it down a few notches, you know, whatever. Like you don't see enough drive 
I think, in people to really get after it, you know, so to speak. So one thing I, I, I saw is, as I was reading your book, one of the things was, you know, that one question you had in, in a police academy, in both, actually, you said Ohio and Arizona, and the question was how the training you received in the academy compared to what competitive fighters go through. And, you know, so, so I know you answered in the book, but in your, in your, just the way, you, you know, in your words, what do you think? How are they any different? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> if you think about it and, and here's, here's the difference. If you're going to fight competitively, if you're going to allow another human being to try to knock your block off, you are going to have to learn how to deal with fear, anxiety, stress, and pressure. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with variability, what to do when things don't go your way. Again, the fights are easy when everything's going according to plan. And it happens sometimes where it's just the coach laid out a plan, you follow the game plan, and it's just start to finish. You go, oh, wow, is that how it's supposed to be? And if you have too many of those, then the brain goes, okay, well, good, we're done. We, you know, we're good enough. And that's, that may be a default mode of the brain to save energy. Good is good enough. If you want to be exceptional, you have to break out of a default mode of the brain, which wants to conserve energy. So even tenacity and resilience, you have to break out of that idea of average. Yeah. You can't be average and be a competitive fighter. Yep. At least in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can become average because there's average in everything, including a SWAT special operations. There's always, there's it, the same distribution happens. It just happens to be at a higher level. So you can be average, but your average is above average of the <laughs> of, of, of the norm. You know, it's it's the average fighter, a competitive fighter, as opposed to the average person. <laughs> yeah. So yep, sorry. look at that risk reward profile you take as a fighter, and you're 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 risking a lot in order to gain a lot. But the police academy is designed to risk a little to what they say is gain a lot, but you don't gain a lot. Because you're not going to gain a lot until you actually step into that arena, until it's real and it's in your face. And the number of people who want to talk about what a shooting is like, yeah, sorry. It wasn't like that when I was in them. So <laughs> I don't think you're lying, but I think you were playing an, a, a non-educated guessing game at the time because it wasn't quite like that. There's nothing like the valence and arousal that happens when it's real, it's in your face, and it's violent. And you're not going to make that in a training environment unless, like, if you look in the beginning of the book, we were talking about surfing the waves off Portugal yeah, yeah. where the waves can get <laughs> to 100 feet. Yeah. You're going to be a pretty darn good surfer before you even attempt to try to surf those waves. Average people don't surf those waves because average people would end up dead. So it's, it's, it's that idea that, yeah, the modern law enforcement is looking for the easiest way to check a box to say you're good enough to hit the street. And they basically say anyone can do this job. And it's the biggest lie that they tell in order to get butts in seats. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of, uh, of recruitment, so, you know, for the past several years, just I noticed this trend with recruits going into law enforcement of just meeting the standards for, let's say, running, just meeting the standards for push ups, just anything, just meet the standards. And, you know, the way I grew up and, you know, growing up as a kid in, in athletics and martial arts and also, you know, later on as I go to, was enlisting in the military, uh, everything had to be above the standard. So I always wanted to score max and even beyond that. If I can go past the max, because for me, I love the challenge, right? I love the challenge of really pushing myself because we, we learned that at an early age, especially if you had great coaches, great instructors in the martial arts they will they will make sure you are uncomfortable as much as possible because they understand what it's going to take to be a champion or what it's going to take for you know this individual to get there and and watching my son right now it's amazing just watching my son in the martial arts world right now i mean he's a, he's a he's a yellow belt right now he he you know went past white now he's a yellow belt he's 12 years old and I love his his motivation now. And and he always now he tells me he's like, Well, Dad, now when I go into the dojo, I have an objective. I have a goal that I want to achieve, you know, with whatever it might be. And I, I said, That is a great attitude, right? You know, he's already at twelve years old, already got, you know, his goals lined up for for that day, whatever it might be, you know, but that's his in his head, that's what he's got. And 
one thing that that you know uh, in in the section where you talk about why tenacity and resiliency right like you said in it it isn't enough to learn how to perform a skill right yeah we can all learn how to do something right that's just the nature of it applying a skill in various situations and using critical thinking is a different thing right when you practice those skills i have i have actually a couple really good uh, rookie comps in my department that uh, for example yesterday one of them called me and was going through hypotheticals with me right you know what about this what about that because we had a call you know a pretty serious call where a road rage incident occurred in another city and the person resides in our city and it involves gun and all that stuff and you know it all worked out and then uh, we got what we needed uh, for the other agency but he had a bunch of hypotheticals and I told him, I like, I like the way you're thinking. I said, that's, you know, yeah, critical skills. Like you're going through the issue and you're trying to figure out how you want to tackle it both legally, you know, that way we're all on, on, on the same page when it comes to criminal procedure and, and constitutional rights and stuff like that. I said, that's awesome. That's what you got to do. I said, you got to think it through that way. When you get into the situation, at least in your brain, you have this roadmap that you already created. And that's that's one thing that I, I see, you know, that you're talking about in this section is that building those those uh those neural pathways in your brain once you achieve a skill. If that may, yeah. It's learning how to predict using the skill. Yeah. So theoretically, and you and you we both seen this, you could train a skill to a high enough level where you have the skill down right up until variability hits. And then when that variability hits, if fear and anxiety raise up and adrenaline and cortisol raise up to certain levels, then your ability to process information, to pattern recognize, to critically think, is technically, the best word for it is it kind of goes offline. Yeah. So if, if cortisol levels get high enough in the brain, the connectivity of the brain decreases while the activity of the brain increases. Yeah. So it's like, Different parts of the brain are firing, but they're not talking to each other. And your critical uh, thinking goes out the window. Yeah. So it's it's conceivable that you could train to be, say, a very good shooter, but not have executive override skills or that meshed control over those skills and could make some tremendous mistakes being very accurate with the gun. Yeah. Now, what could also happen is you train to a very good high level of skill, but without adding emotional content, that affect, valence and arousal into your training. And when that affect gets up and that cortisol goes up and the adrenaline goes up, the skill falls apart. So there's, we, and we've seen it all. You've seen mediocre people perform very well, very good people like on the range perform very poorly and everywhere in between, yeah. including people who are very good on the range perform very well in a gunfight. Yeah. But what's the disconnect between that? Because what good is it to have a skill if you can't use it? Yeah. And there's, and I use the example in the book, you go to gyms and there's people who hit that heavy bag so pretty in the gym yeah. and their technique is so beautiful, but they never spar. So variability is going to happen when that other push and when, when the other heavy bag with arms and legs starts punching and kicking <laughs> it back. Yeah. So it's, it's not enough to have the skill. You have to be able to think with the skill set. That's the next level. The level above that is higher control over those skills. And that's the chapter on mesh control, which to me is, that's the, the mind-blowing biggest connection between your, e even in your peak performers, your 5%, that's your 1%. Your 1% people are the people who have that higher control. They can turn it on and off in a heartbeat. They have fine discriminatory, uh, discriminatory control over say the pulling of the trigger they don't yeah. empty the gun yeah they are thinking with the gun in their hand yeah no that that reminds me of the the four four stages of competence have you heard of, have you heard of those just kind of what we were talking yeah you know unconscious comp incompetence conscious incompetence conscious competence and unconscious competence so it comes to the point where you know i'll briefly describe each one is that incompetence competence is you know the learner's unaware that a skill or knowledge gap exists conscious incompetence is the conscious incompetence is a learner's aware of a skill or knowledge gap and understands the importance of acquiring new skill and kind of learning begins there conscious competence your you know you know you, you, the learner knows how to use the skill or perform the task but doing so requires practice conscious thought and hard work 
And then you got an unconscious competence. That's where you got the uncon. The individual has enough experience with the skill that he or she can perform it easily. They do it unconsciously. So it reminds me again, you know, that that whole battle drills and muscle memory, building that muscle memory, quote unquote. You know, I know it's not really muscle memory, but that's the way that's the way it's easy to describe where you do a certain skill over and over and over and over again, you know, whether let's say room clearing, right? Just, you know, straight room clearing on a SWAT team, you know, we do it over and over and over and over again in different situations and different scenarios and a hundred million other things they'll throw at us. So that way, when the, when shit hits the fan, right? Like you said, that variability gets introduced, our bodies are, or our reactions are going to be more automatic. Yeah. Fear and all that is going to set in hundred percent. But it we are it's still that's that unconscious competence is gonna assist us in you know busting through or going through that threshold to get the to get the bad guy who's presented that lethal force or whatever it might be, you know it just reminds me like you know overseas when you know when when someone got hit by an ID and unfortunately died, you know when I was you know when we were there, I felt my whole body was automatic because I was working the radio, was getting air support in everything. I didn't it it, it was not one real conscious thought. Because to me, I was taking in the entire scene and divvying up the tasks automatically. It just it just happens, you know. Again, that that goes into that unconscious, and I'm sure you've seen it, you know, in in in, in that world also, you know, in Arizona and, and various other places you've gone to, where you do have those peak performers, like you said, that five percent, but then you got that one percent that are still able to complete whatever task under that much duress. Yeah, and within so what what you just talked about, where you're you're doing multiple different things, but you don't feel like you're consciously processing, that's your fifth stage. Yeah. That's mesh tire control. Yeah. So the, the idea, a lot of people are like, well, you're 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 not even thinking that the brain, the the frontal parts of the brain aren't even working, but the fact is they are. No, they are. What they are doing is at that level, the the theory is that you are thinking parts of your brain are co- are just holding higher strategic control. Yep. So they're only looking for where is the uncertainty? And if there's going to be uncertainty, it's going to require some conscious processing. But as long as your brain is pattern recognizing and it's going through the everything you need to do, it feels like it's unconscious, but there is some conscious control. Yep. So technically there's five stages. That fifth stage is that higher order mesh control. At the unconscious competence stage, yes, you have the skill set, but you don't may not necessarily be able to higher order plan with it. Gotcha. So that's the fifth level. Yeah. And what the theory is, and it's an interesting theory, is that if you can present the training so that instead of teaching techniques, I, te- I give you problems and you solve the problem that you can bypass some of that conscious processing and get right to the good stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea behind it. The, the, some of the different training methodologies that the affective neuroscientists would say is probably a little better way to go. Yeah, that reminds me of a lot of the, some of the schools, even, you know, for uh, Green Beret, Special Forces type stuff where, you know, all, they, all the trainers do is present to you a problem. Now you have to figure it out, right? That's, that's all they said. Hey, you know, like some of the more famous ones is, you know, you got a couple logs, wheels, whatever. You got to figure out how to move it from point A to point B and that's it. You have to solve the problem. They're not going to tell you what to do that's your problem and you figure it out. So I think, I think like you said, though, with, when it comes to training the mind and, and training uh, in general, whether it's physical or even mental, I think, like you said, I, I, I really like the problem solving scenarios because it, it forces you to really think on the scenario, just like, you know, when we do force on force or whatever, hey, here's the scenario, go, you know, figure it out. And uh, I think you get so much more out of training than just lecturing and talking at, you know, students. Well, if you, if you look at it, the neuroscience supports it. Yeah. Because it's, it's motivation, focus, and agitation that open up neuroplasticity in adults. Yeah. And, and how do you do it? it? Number one, you have to have a motivated student. Doesn't matter how good your program is. If your student isn't motivated. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I'm just going to fart it off. Yeah. Agitation is caused by prediction error. So I set it up so that you you are going to run into a series of mistakes and you're going to have to problem solve and correct those mistakes. If you are motivated and agitated, then there, a bit, your brain will give you the ability to focus. And when you focus and get that hyper-focus and you find a solution, 
you're not going to forget that solution yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. That's, that's the key to this style of learning. I'm not here to give you my 15 best fight techniques and here's your DT catalog yeah. because that's horse shit. Yeah. Every agency that's doing it is completely lying to you. Every training you go to where everyone in the room is doing the same thing, it's not that you're not learning. It's that you're learning in the slowest route possible because it's not designed for you. It's designed for the least common denominator in the room. So that's kind of the idea behind it is desirable difficulty. It's the idea of, I want you to get used to the fact that being uncomfortable is the point. Yeah. It really is the point. I want you making mistakes in training and I want you to fix those mistakes in training before they become a problem in the real world. That's, I think, the one of the biggest shortfalls when it comes to training and, and, and the law enforcement community is you don't get enough of that. You know, like, you know, I'll go to the range. Like I said, I always say, like, any anytime the range comes up, like, my, you know, when, when I'm teaching or, or whatever, as a range instructor, my blood pressure is through the roof because it's like, geez, you know, it's like, to me, I I hate lumping everyone in one firing line like you have your advanced shooters you have your work you know you have some really good guys that do things and good at guys and gals that know how to shoot and do a good job and then you have again you know where where we're forced though to train to the lowest common denominator now those more advanced shooters or the more uh, motivated cops are not getting the full training that they would want so i've i've even you know gone to the point where i've suggested you know, breaking up the range into different phases, like, you know, have the advanced people, you know, call it team A, team B, team C, whatever. And it, it turned into, well, you know, we, we, we might hurt feelings or whatever. I'm like, well, you know what, if you, if you're on C team, it means you need a lot of work. And if you want to get to the fun stuff that a team does, well, then work harder. And then you'll be more than welcomed into a team to do some of the real training, because I, I hate having to dumb it down for the more advanced people, because I, I feel like because me, when, when I was out on that line, I felt like it was a waste of time for me because I'm just doing some really basic shit where, you know, I'm lucky I'm on a SWAT team where everything we do is a lot more advanced and I'm challenged all the time. Every time you, we go to a range on SWAT, you know, as well as I do, you are challenged. They're not going to we're not standing there static, just shooting at targets just to, you know, make it look great. No, we're combat shooting. We are doing things in full kit you know, running around, getting cover, doing room entries, live fire room entries, right? And it 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 forces you again to to hit that fifth level that you're talking about and to really be able to hone in on your skill set versus to stay in that comfortable zone. That's exactly right. And then I think one of the bigger we sometimes assume that because someone can't perform well that they're unmotivated. And a lot of times it's just no one's ever really shown them how to get there. Yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the problem too. Now, don't get me wrong. There are probably, I would say, 5% of people in law enforcement who have no business being <laughs> yeah. at all. 100%. And I, and I think it's about 5%. Yeah. Now you take 75%, the next 75%, and think they're open to ideas. They just don't know how to learn. They don't have a lot of... You know, it, it's I hate to say it, but when you think about it, the top 20% usually come from some form of a athletic or competitive background where they're used to showing it, put it, you know, showing your stuff, putting it out there and dealing with the fact that you sometimes don't win all the time, right? So I, I think that a lot of times we do that and then we go, well, we just assume they're dumb and then we treat them as if they're dumb and we design the training as if they're dumb. Instead of looking at, all right, I, everybody has constraints and affordances. They have pluses, they have minuses. Is there a way to design training so we can bring those out where they can find better affordances? And then when we look at their weaknesses, can they work around them and can we build them up and make them strengths? And we can do it. It just, it takes us to get out of the cookie cutter programs and to look at the individual instead of the group. And that's the hard part. And that was one of the other goals of the book was to get people thinking, it's not my job to take a group of 15 people and train them all the same way. I want to look at 15 individuals and decide the best way. And it doesn't take that much more time no. to make some adjustments to shooting, to DT, 
in order to individualize the experience a little bit. It just takes a little bit of creativity in the program design. That's all. That's why you say that. I was uh, recently invited up to SIG Academy in Epping, New Hampshire to uh, teach, and I taught you know, the, the class that, uh, that I do, the stress exposure and then, you know, basically the neuroscience behind stress, uh, neurophysiology and stress physiology, the, you know, the, all the science behind it and apply it on different scenarios, the range, all that stuff. And, you know, we had 15 cops and that's exactly the way I did it, right? Because you had SWAT boys, you had SWAT guys, you had some really high performing cops, you had cops who are like blue belts slash black belts to, in BJJ. And, you know, so, and then you had your, the other pendulum, the ones who aren't that athletic or aren't that, you know, gun savvy or whatever you call, it. but every scenario, every training was catered to them individually. And I told them, I said, listen, this is more of an individual performance than a team performance. This is something for you to learn about yourself. Sure, if I throw you guys into a scenario, sure, it's going to be two, three cops you know, showing up to a fight or whatever. But in the end, I'm looking at each of you individually on how you perform. And then we'll talk about the team asset, but it's more about the individual. And, and I literally told them you know, that part of my br safety briefing is get comfortable with being uncomfortable because you are, I guarantee you, you are going to be uncomfortable. It's going to suck and you're not going to like it, but that's how you learn. That's how you grow. And, you know, by the end of the two days, they absolutely love the program. And they even, you know, like, like they said, it's, it's just being uncomfortable. Some of them realized that automatically they're actually doing well. Well, yeah, because I step, I made you step it up a little more. I made you more, you think you're acting more, you know, automatic, but your brain is doing far more. It's going into that Rolodex that you've trained all these years, and it's just plucking out the stuff that you need for that moment. It's saving energy, right? Like you said, with the brain, it's trying to conserve energy. So it's giving you those predictive patterns or those predictive behaviors that you've seen over the course of your career. And you're like, oh, this is what's happening here, you know? And so, so I mean, what, one quote that you had is, is that I like is the mediocrity may be, in fact, a default mode of operation. That's what we were talking about, about, you know, all these, a lot of these younger cops or even anyone else going into any sort of field is just, yeah, let's just do it good enough. That way we stay under the radar, right? And not get in quote unquote trouble. And you know, as well as I do, any good law enforcement officer, military member, EMS, whatever, anyone who really strives for that peak performance, you're going to get, you're going to do mistakes no matter what. It's going to happen, you know, and of you're, you're going to make those mistakes. And that's the thing, you know, like you said. I'd rather those mistakes happen during training because in the real world, it's life and death, you know, when, when it's certain situations and, you know, you start talking about resilience versus tenacity. All right. And uh, if you could just explain to listen, just like, what is the difference between resilience and tenacity? Yeah. So a lot of people use them interchangeably. And that's, I think, I think that's a slight mistake. So here's, here's the difference. Tenacity is the ability to lean in and to seek discomfort. It's seeking desirable difficulties. So I know it's going to be hard and I'm, I decide beforehand. So the University of Arizona did a study and it was involving machine learning, but they equated it to the human brain and they found that about a 15 to 20% error rate. So you're making mistakes 15 to 20% of the time is ideal for learning. So I want to set up the training so it's it's hard enough that you are making mistakes 15 to 20% of the time. Tenacity is the idea of leaning into that. I understand it's going to happen. Instead of getting mad, understand that the agitation that you feel when you make a mistake is adrenaline. And adrenaline is stage one to opening up neuroplasticity in the brain. Stage two is the idea that the brain wants to solve the problem and remember it for the conservation of energy, that brings acetylcholine online from the brainstem. And then when the brain finds a solution, you get another release of acetylcholine from the basal frontal part of the brain. And now you get open up plasticity. So that, that does difficulty, that agitation and that error correction is absolutely essential to adult learning. So it's <laughs> the idea of if I lean into desirable difficulties, the brain has a reward pattern for forward motion, for seeking behavior. And that's the release of dopamine. And dopamine is that molecule of motivation. It gives you the motivation. So tenacity is the idea of I want to lean in. 
Some people would find a roller coaster ride a horrible experience. Others love it. Some people love horror movies. Some people don't. Some people can't stand the idea of jumping out of an airplane. And some people have done it thousands of times. There's tremendous variability in the brain. But the idea of seeking desirable difficulties, of leaning into the problem, the brain rewards you. And the nice thing about tenacity and resilience, which I'll talk about next, is it seems that they are very generic mechanisms in the brain. The majority of the brain works under specific adaptation to impose demand. It does not seem that tenacity and resilience do. So when you show tenacity, resilience in small things and you build a habit up, you will show it in bigger things. So tenacity, I'm leaning in. I'm accepting the fact this is going to be difficult. And then when it becomes difficult, I don't get mad at myself. Instead, I take that agitation and I go, that's part of the process. Now, the good thing about it is now at the level I've been fighting since I was 12 years old, if I want to learn something new or I want to morph something that I'm training with, my errors now, I want them at 40 and 50%. I'm looking for errors everywhere. I don't, I'm not worried about what I know. I'm worried about what I don't know. Yeah. So I want to see if I can make errors happen at a greater rate. Yeah. So there's going to be this balance back and forth in the errors. Yeah. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. So there's two different, it, it works two different ways. One, you, you get the error, boom, now you're agitated. Res, part of resilience is that accepting that, all right, I made the mistake now, let's solve the problem. The second part of resilience is, after any one of these events, after any time your valence and arousal are pulled away from the norm, if you do not recover your valence and arousal to their homeostatic levels, then the next decision you make is made from the new level of valence and arousal, not the old. So if you think about it, you've had a rough day at work, you come home, something insignificant, inconsequential happens and you lose your shit. It has nothing to do with the person at home. It has everything to do with everything that happened at work. Yeah. Because your body is predicting not only what's happening out there and what to do about it, but how much energy you need to deal with it. Yeah. But it can only predict how much energy you need based off your homeostatic point, your natural setting point. No. If you get pulled too far from that natural setting point, then you don't have resilience and it will affect your decision making. Yeah. It's the idea of like, let's say you're sick already. You're on your way to work and you get a phone call from your boss. Hey, I need to talk to you. You've got an excessive force complaint from yesterday. And by the way, your two reports in the hole, you got to get that done. And uh, we're holding 15 calls right now. So please hurry up. And now you're agitated. Yeah. And then you start to deal with that. You go to the first call and it is inconsequential. You go to the second call and it's something so horrible done to a child. You're like, oh my God, how do humans do this? But then you go to another call and you have not recovered yet. And that next call is, again, inconsequential, but the person's being a pain in the ass and you go off. Yep. It had nothing to do with them and everything to do with before. So tenacity, I lean in. I seek the difficulty. Resilience, I recover from it. I give myself adequate time to recover, not only from that, at the end of the day, from the whole day and in between episodes, from each individual episode, vitally important. So tenacious resilience is the idea of connecting those ideas. I'm seeking difficulty so that I can show resilience from difficulty. And then I'm going to seek even more in this continuous feedback loop of error prediction, error correction. I, I actually, I, I love that description, the way you, you just put it in, in, in your words. It just, again, like I had all these memories just flood just of times that I've seen, you know, students or even myself where, you know, I, I didn't perform as well or, or whatever it might be. And I'm like, oh, fuck it. You know, let's do it again. And I just crush whatever I want to do. My uh, my partner, my, <laughs> my old partner, we were doing a shooting competition. And you know where you ha you're doing the shooting and you got all the discs lined up, the, the, the plates lined up, you know, like they got like 12 of them in a row and you got to knock them all down and, you know, get timing, whatever. And I just sucked. And, you know, I was like maybe seven yards away, five yards away from those things. And boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, what the hell, man? Like I, it just, you know, I would miss, I would miss. And I'm like, what really? So, so I go back to do it and my partner's like oh shit i'm as pissed get ready and it was like boom 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 you know one after another just went right down and it, you know it reminds me of that where that that tenaciousness or that resilience okay i bounced back from performing bad now i'm agitated and because one i know what i'm capable of right that is difference when 
you have you know what you're capable of or let's just say you don't know what you're capable of because you keep pushing yourself all the time and and you you know you go up there and you perform you actually do it really well and you're like there you go and it reminds me of some of the uh, world's greatest powerlifters that i've seen right when they fail their first set of their pr right i mean you see them i mean you know you have to take like three four minutes off because you know you're you're dealing with a lot of weight and you see them sit down then they'll come back and boom, they just bounce right back and just lift whatever. You know, I remember when I was first doing my first heavy, heavy deadlift, and uh, it was part of the powerlifting training program I was doing. And, you know, it was like, it was a usual weight that I'm used to where I could easily do five reps. But for some reason, you know, I go up there, boom, go to lift it, and I could barely get the bar off the ground. And I'm like, what the, f-? again, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, okay, let me relax first, you know. Took a break, just kind of walked around a little bit, just thinking in my head, going through that Rolodex of what I'm supposed to do when I get to the bar, you know, rooting, bracing, you know, curling the bar, you know, like like a towel. So I went through all those steps in my head, visualized myself lifting or doing that lift. And once my timer runs up, I went right up there and lifted it like it was not. I'm like, why didn't I do that the first time? But but, you know, it, it really makes sense with that tenacious resilience. It, it The way you word it, resilience is when you bounce back is and tenacious is when you dive forward, you know, when you lean forward into that task. And and I really like how how you how you described it just like that. And, you know, it in terms of the dopamine, right? I'm finding this a lot too. And it could be just with the with the idea of, you know, instant gratification. Unfortunately, with these smartphones and social media and everything, humans have been programmed now to get that instant gratification where, you know, it I think it this has hurt us a lot more than help us in as a, as as humans because again that drive, you don't see it as much because now you're getting your dopamine fix here versus completing a task very well, right? And it's it's more more here. And so, I mean, what do you find in terms of the, the that sort of dopamine? I mean, I've been seeing a lot of this dopamine detox type talk, you know, <laughs> this, you know, get off social media for like a month so you can detox and all that. I mean, I know you talk about dopamine in, in, in the book. How do you, in terms of the relationship with the t- tenacious resilience and dopamine, I think you, you talked about it a little bit, just because, you know, you, I think you said to be able to complete that task, you get that hit of dopamine because you, you did it and, and now you feel good about it. Is it something that constantly happens with tenacious resilience where you keep getting those dopamine hits and, and you know, you're feeling good about yourself? Is, is that something that's constantly happening or is it one of those like, you know, you got your ups and downs, ups and downs? Well, it's ups and downs because it's interesting. The, the, the reward system of the brain, there's so there is there's. There's wants and there's control over those wants. So you have a desire circuit, which is run by dopamine. And then you have a control over that desire circuit, another control network, which goes to the frontal part of the brain, also controlled by dopamine. So dopamine is so powerful. The only way to control it is with dopamine and another circuit. But so resilience is that. And this is, this is the the best analogy I can, I, I can come up with, with, with how dopamine works. You go on vacation and you are having the time of your life. It is this experience that goes peak performance after peak performance. Beautiful sights, beautiful experiences, awesome company. And then you come back from this vacation and there's this letdown period, this period of like depression where you're like, oh my God, it'll never be as good again. It couldn't get any better than that. As it turns out, that is the dopamine system resetting itself. So dopamine is interesting because let's say you have a baseline level here and you have an experience that takes your baseline level up here. In order to reset, the dopamine system is going to have to take you in not just an equivalent amount in the negative direction, but a little bit more to reset itself. And the reason is you you have to know the difference between I just won five bucks and an orgasm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they were the same, yeah. we would be really tired all the time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So the brain has to have this way of differentiating things and it uses dopamine for that profile. So after these heightened events, there has to be this letdown and you have to understand that. If you don't understand that, then you can really get into depression because you can stay in that. And that's really what depression is. Depression is, if you look at anxiety and depression, 
First, your brain predicts anxiousness and anxiety is uncertainty. So the brain is very uncertain, uncertain about where you are in the world, your ability to deal with the world. And it uses a tremendous amount of energy in that anxiety. The next thing the brain will predict is depression because you run out of the energy. And now the brain predicts like sickness behavior. Just sit there. Nothing good's going to happen anyway. So just stay there. That's the dopamine system. And if you pull too much without recovery, that's what can happen. You can basically take the system so out of whack that your predictions come out of whack because your, your predictions are tied to your valence and arousal. That's what makes a, an embodied experience. Your emotions are built up of valence and arousal. Valence, it either feels good for you or bad for you. Arousal, high, medium, or low. And arousal is a measure of uncertainty. So if you have high arousal levels, the brain is at high uncertainty levels. Yeah. It just, it, it, again, like the fascination of the brain, right? Just not being able to tell the difference between things that you're doing because in the end, the brain is an organ responding to whatever it might be in front of you. And it just, I find it fascinating that, you know, you can, during training, you can trick the brain, even though it's training, you can trick the brain to the point where you can induce cognitive overload or even amygdala hijack, depending on how intense the training is, even though it's not real train, you know, it's not the real situation or real scenario. The brain just will play that trick to you like oh shit is this really happening because you hear like you know a few of my friends went through seer school in for the army and every single one of them told me like at some point you actually believe you are a real pow you completely forget that this is a training exercise and you actually think you're being held and 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 that's the part that's where you know with the army they the military they do a really good job of breaking the brain down to the point where uh, to the point of exhaustion where you feel that this is this is actually a real situation right now. So so one thing I want to cover is the mesh the mesh theory. I know we 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 touched on it earlier and talked about it because I I think the bulk of towards the end of your book the bulk of it is talking about that mesh theory with the predictive behaviors and stuff like that. And if you could just go into just talking about you know the mesh mesh theory, especially the the three parts to it i think you talk about you know like whether it's adaptive control or or you know however uh, yeah if you so, can just go into that if, if you think about it and and I, i'll use the same analogy i used in the book because it's just it's simple and keeps it coherent let's say that you were going to mountain bike and it's a let's say a 40 or a 50 mile trek and your goal is to go up a mountain and you're going to end at a mountain lake okay and you're good at biking, so you, you're, you, you don't need to think about how to steer, how to pedal, how to keep your balance. You're good at biking. And you're good at jumps. You're good at all the things you need to do on a mountain bike ride. Okay? Higher strategic control is, is, is the higher level. So mesh control says that the frontal parts of your brain don't need to think about how to ride the bike. They don't have to, they don't have to think about any of the mechanism work of doing the work. What they need to do is keep the big goal in mind. So higher strategic goal... Uh, uh, higher strategic goals are that big goal. I want to make it to the mountain lake, okay? Situational controls are what come up along the way. So a situational control would be normally you get an open path. Now there's a huge boulder in your way. So now you need, a, you, you need to solve a specific problem. So you're going to find a way to solve it. Your implementation controls, those are the ones that are that automatize the best. Those are the ones where your unconscious competence comes into play. So let's say the boulder's in your way and you see different ways of solving the problem. Once you choose which one, you just go into an implementation control. So let's say there's a jump off to the right, then you jag back to the left, you're back on the path again. Once you make that decision, boom, you're into implementation control, you don't have to think about it. But the strategic control part invited your consciousness because uncertainty created a choice. And that's pretty much what the free energy principle is. Your conscious experiences come up because in your brain's prediction, there's uncertainty and uncertainty invites a choice. If the brain has a certain answer, it's going to take it. Yeah. So higher strategic control keeps the broad goal in mind. There's no point in stopping here and going back the other way because there's a boulder in my way. I want to get up there to the mountain lake. That's higher strategic control. Situational control, I'm solving the problem of the border in my way or the boulder in my way. 
And then an implementation control is any of the tasks, the subconscious tasks I have for, for doing the quick jump out of the way and the jag back to the left. So, and you have, you have like a smooth control and you have your implementation controls. And, and again, those implementation controls are the ones that automatize the best. So if we were, were referring to like, like a combat shooting, once you make the decision to shoot and you've gone through your process, guns in hand, guns up, I, 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 hopefully you unconsciously already know that you can line your sights up with your eyes. If you don't, you're not ready for combat <laughs> yeah, shooting, yeah. but that's a whole other, yeah. that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Once you make that decision to shoot with higher order control, it's, is he still up? Is there anything in my way? Did, did an innocent person cross my path? Can I come off that trigger? And what you will see is at the mesh control level, you won't see that emptying of the gun because you're going to see this higher order control knowing it's the idea of I can only shoot as fast as I can accurately process information, not as fast as I can shoot the gun. Yeah. Because if you can shoot one six splits, you can shoot faster than you could think. Yeah. But that's, that's a good skill to have but it's dangerous if you're trying to apply it in a combat environment without having that higher order control. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. So it's kind of the way I'm thinking about it is, you know, when, when we talk about the cardinal rules of, of gun, you know, at the range, know what you're shooting at, what's beyond it, right? Especially that when, especially when, I, when I'm watching, you know, a lot of these uh, YouTube body cam videos and, you know, the, the cop is so aroused, we will call it, you know, when, when there's a shooting going on, he's shooting back, he or she's shooting back. But then, you know, the backdrop, though, is there's civilians, there's like stores, there's all of that stuff going on in the background where they are so hyper focused and so tunnel visioned that when they made that conscious decision to shoot back, rightfully so, because they're being engaged, you would want, you know, you one would think, okay, they're in an extremely populated area. I hope they took that into consideration when they were shooting back. Because yeah, bad guys, they don't account for their, they don't, they could care less. But for us in this profession, we're obligated to make sure that not only do we stop the threat, but also public safety, right? Yeah, and that's the that's another thing I mentioned in the book. A, a lot of a lot of people who look at police shootings will say something like, well, common sense dictates. Common sense is for common situations. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Situations. <laughs> yeah. So the brain, and this is the other disconnect sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. At the SWAT level, people are much better at introducing valence and arousal into the training. But if the brain can only predict off your past behavior, your relevant past behavior, when you're in your first shooting and someone is trying to kill you, and you've never had that happen before, your brain is going to go all hands on deck. And that all hands on deck is going to be adrenaline and cortisol. There's two different places where cortisol can heavily affect you. One is the hippocampus, where it has high affinity receptors. It will quickly grab the cortisol. Now, that's not necessarily bad. Cortisol isn't a bad thing. It wakes you up. It keeps you moving. But there are, are lower affinity receptors in the frontal cortex. When those when cortisol gets into those receptors, that's when the brain starts to scramble and there's this disconnectivity between different parts of the brain. And then what tends to happen is you don't see normally because of the tunnel vision. Time is perceived differently. And, and, and one of the unique things is peak performers seem to think that time slows down and people who are having a fear episode, an extreme fear episode, seem to think like they're moving in quicksand, but everything in front of them is happening at much faster speed. That's time slicing and that's just the brain. It's not, it, it's, it's how the brain is perceiving because again, the brain can only guess. It's locked in a bone vault. The brain doesn't <laughs> see, your eyes don't see, your ears don't hear. Yeah, They gather information and they turn it into electrochemical signals that the brain has to infer. Yeah. So what most people think that that sense, think, act model is how the brain works. It's not. The brain doesn't wait for all that data to come in and then interpret the data. The brain takes a best guess about what's out there, what it's going to see, what it's going to hear, what it's going to feel, and how and what would I feel like if this prediction were true? Yeah. And that can only be done off your past. So if you've never been in a situation before where that adrenaline and cortisol is up, 
then stand by because your best hope is going to be that the other person sucks more than you do. And that's it. Now, there, there are ways of dealing with that in training, but now we're getting back to that. Well, let's not get anybody hurt. Let's train to the least common denominator in the room instead of the way we should be training. Yeah, that's I mean, that that that's the thing is, is the you know, the, the training methodology that that law enforcement has subscribed to for the last, I don't know, 20 years, we'll say probably even longer than that. I'm sure, you know, just it, it, it's, it's not training for that. Right. They're not training you for these specific things or or whatever. Like you said, it's a check the box. All right. We got our range time in. We got legal updates in. We got this. We got that. All right, we're good. You know, we're good for the year. You know, every year we do, you know, in service for a whole week and it's all the different things, but man, it's, it's, <laughs> you just lose your mind just sitting there because it's, it, you know, you're being talked at and it's death by PowerPoint. And you're like, this is, this is not the way to learn, you know, and, and to actually test the, the proficiency of the officers in the room, you know, that, that does not test. I always tell people, I say, listen, I, I don't, anyone can qual with a gun. But are you proficient with that gun or are you prof- proficient in the defensive tactics or, are, you know, yesterday, actually, uh, one of my uh, newer officers came up to me. Actually, he's still he's still brand new. He's still at OIT software and training and he's on FTO. So his FTO came up to me and he said, hey, Sarge, can you kind of walk him through room clearing and different a couple of other things? I said, absolutely. So went downstairs to uh, the cell block. It was empty. So we were just kind of going through a couple little things and. You know, one of the scenarios that, that the brand new guy asked me was, well, if somebody's in the corner, you, you pop the corner, he's right there, you know, because the wall's close or whatever. So I, I gave him a couple techniques. I said, oh, yeah, you know, you do this, you grab him. And then, you know, I gave him some a couple little, you know, uh, easy techniques, wrist lock techniques for him to practice and do. And he was blown away because that's not what is being taught at the academy level. I said, yeah, well, yeah, the academy is just check the box, man. They're not going to really teach you the real stuff to do because they need to get you out the door so you can get to the streets. But you're not ready for the streets at all. You know, that that's that's the reality of law enforcement training. And I'm sure you've seen it yourself. Yeah, and that's and, and I don't think it was I don't think there was anything nefarious. And no, 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 no. Yeah, it's you know, it's. When you deal with government politics, it's let's look for the easiest way of getting butts in seats. So I, yeah. I get it. But if you understand that prediction is embodied prediction, it's yeah. it's a full body. Your, 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 your predictions are not only exteroception, what's happening out there, they're interoception, what's happening in your body, including proprioception, what you should feel, how you should move. Those are all predictions. Yeah. So what happens is you train without the valence and arousal, without the emotional content, and you can develop pretty good skills. It's not like, like, like cops pass their qual. That's average shooting. So most cops are average shooters. Yeah. And they pass the qual fine. You know, you have your people who are very nervous about it because they just don't like to perform, but most of them pass the qual no problem. But that's not combat shooting because in combat shooting, you have the embodied experience. You have the valence and the arousal. And if the brain isn't used to how much valence and arousal to predict, then it will go red line. It will predict, rev it up, baby. Let's get it done. So if you think about it, the brain is 2% of your body weight, but it uses 20% of your overall energy just to keep you moving and predicting normally. How much more energy does it need under extreme valence and arousal? So that's the problem when it has that much. And when, when it just goes all hands on deck, you are not thinking you are just an angry monkey, man. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah. You're no better than a chimpanzee flinging its shit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's actually pretty good. So, so now, you know, getting to later on in the book, I was just reading kind of how you, you're talking about building uh, these training programs. You, you started to get into it a little bit and, and, Thing is, you know, within the law enforcement world, like you said, you know, government, whatever, I don't find any room a lot of times to be able to implement certain programs into the training because, you know, we have like in the post states, right, there's certain requirements that we have to fulfill based on post standards, right? And, and you know, the way I'm seeing it is because, you know, where, where I live in Massachusetts, you know, it's a it's newer post state and my God, man, the amount of legwork it takes just to say you're certified to teach x i mean you know it 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 like it takes more time for me to prove that i am 
qualified to teach than I am teaching, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it has to be their curriculum, right? There's no real deviance from their curriculum because they want you to do a PowerPoint. They want this, they want that. And that's it. Like it's, it's their way or no way. So do you find in terms of like building a training program within the law enforcement community is even a training program like this that really puts the effort into the individual officer rather than the collective? Yeah, so we, yeah, most of your programs across the United States are designed for the weakest person in the room. And it is just everybody cookie cutter learns the same thing. So in the book, I kind of gave you the, in, in my perfect world, this is how it would be. Yeah. But if you look at what, what are the two biggest connections in training between how to take someone who's just an average performer in a room and getting them ready for a true performance environment, it's going to be variability and representativeness. So how close is it that I can safely make it to the real performance environment? And can I get them used to variability? So an example I always give, because this is the number one question that gets asked whenever I speak. And it's the reason why I turn down more work than I take. Because everybody wants a cookie cutter program. Show me the techniques. Everybody has to learn the same thing. And I go, hey, listen, I'm not your guy. I could take your money and happily walk away with the checkbox, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So here's what I can do for you. So when I talk to instructors, I tell them, Let's say, let's keep it simple. Let's say that you, the, the post says you must teach a, 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 a mount escape. Yeah. And it's got to be trap the arm, trap the leg, go over your shoulder. Everybody learns the same thing. And it's like, okay, now I can show that technique. But my question to the people at all of the posts is, why does wrestling and jujitsu have weight classes? Mm-hmm. And if they have weight classes, then how do I expect a 130-pound cop to get a 250-pound person off of them using that technique? Yeah. Because it isn't going to work. Yeah. And we all know that. Yeah. So here's what I do. I show them the technique. And then I show them what it looks like when the technique doesn't work. And now I go, okay, can I create a problem that invites you to find other solutions? And I'm not going to give you a lot of answers. I want you to find it. So I'm going to create different problems. And I may ask a question of you like, well, what do you have available to you besides that? Okay, the technique didn't work. It happens. What do you have available to you? Now let them start to problem solve. If they ask me a question, I'll give them feedback. But I'm really trying to set it up so that they problem solve. Now we're introducing that variability. It's a little bit more representative too, because in the real world, the first thing you do doesn't work. If, if you're fighting someone and the first thing you do works, they suck. Yeah, yeah I know. You got lucky. Person yeah. <laughs> if I throw a jab and you don't block it, I'm just going to throw another jab. If <laughs> yeah. you eat six of them, well. <laughs> That's on you. That's on you. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, you can still meet the requirements and say there is the technique, but understand that no technique is foolproof. It's not going, it's not guaranteed to work. So what do we do when it doesn't work? And the answers are going to be different. So for instance, let's say I have a 180 pound guy on me and I've been doing this a long time and I, I, I'm having a hard time getting him off me with that. So I go to some other technique I know, no big deal. Yeah. But a 130 pound female wearing a gun belt and all of her gear, you're like a turtle on your back with all that gear on. You have to protect the gun. You have to protect all the other gear. She may have to escalate this to a higher level. Yeah. So she may be grabbing, tearing, ripping or inserting something in order to get this job done. And I better be willing as a person looking at that use of force to go, no, that makes sense. Because if we want everyone to do the same things all the time, then you better only hire 200 plus pound men who are all <laughs> fantastic wrestlers and boxers and competitive shooters yeah. who have all been in combat situations before. Yeah. There you go. I mean, there's your problem. You want to solve the problem? There it is right there. Yeah. But we're not going to do that. And I'm not saying we should. So before I get the hate mail, <laughs> my under 180 pounds, yeah. that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the answer isn't the same for everyone. Yeah. But we train as if the answer is the same for everyone. And we're setting our people up for failure because of it. So could I introduce a way 
where they're solving some problems and they're learning how to solve the problem without it being a specific technique. Does that make sense? No, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And and that's the thing, you know, whenever I, I teach is it's just I'm, I'm a big fan to having the student come up with the solution. Like, you know, I always, I always tell them, I'm like, listen, I don't have all the answers. It's just, you know, but I will also work through it. You know, like I want you to discover the answer for you because everybody's different, right? Everybody's trained different. We're all, we're all, every human is different. We all have our own shit or stuff, you know? And, and I try as much as I can to bring the individual out you know, versus, you know, being ducks in a row doing room clearing where everyone keeps their head down and just boom, boom, boom and all that. And I'm like, no, 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 don't put your head down or don't follow the guy in front of you. What do you see? What, what's what's around you when you enter that room? You know, what what what, what problems are you seeing in front of you and how are you going to solve it? You know, that that's what, you know, one thing we always say at SWAT is, you know, always find work. There's always something to do when you do a room entry, always, right? So always find work, always find work. And, you know, that's something that, that I harp on all the time. So it, 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 it pretty much, you know, along the lines of, like you said, the post states, you know, doing cookie cutter training, like you said, does not work for everybody, right? Sure. We, like you said, we can show a baseline technique. Keep it at a baseline. Let's just say this is the baseline technique, right? This is how we're starting. Okay. Now that you've quote unquote, I wouldn't call mastered, but now you got the hang of this baseline. Now we're going to step it up, you know, build off that technique, just like in the martial arts, as, as we were growing up, right? Our, our instructors, senseis, shihans, whatever you call them, they always worked off the baseline technique, right? They teach you the simple wrist lock. Okay. And as you progress in your belt or weight class or whatever, it starts getting a little more advanced. And it all started with the simple wrist lock. And now you're building from there. And, you know, you keep going and keep going and keep going. So I think, I think you know, these the, the post-states, it, it makes perfect sense to me where they make it simple. All right, there's a baseline for everybody. But also allow the instructor to now, okay, here's the baseline. Now we're going to move on to more advanced st- stuff. Because like you said, you have officers who are very advanced in these things. And they're not getting the most out of the training when you're only allowed to do baseline. And, and so when you think about it, Again, it goes right back to, I want to set it up, and and you talked about it. You want to set it up that they solve the problem. Now, it doesn't mean you don't teach techniques, but here's the thing about techniques. If I am very clear about the reasons behind, the principles behind why a technique works, then one technique can become three or four techniques. Yeah, yeah. So instead of this idea of you are in a mount, and now you must solve the problem of the mount, it's you are on your back and you there's only two places you want to be instead of on your back. You either you want on the top of that guy with control or you want to be up on your feet. So there's your higher goal. Now start learning right from the beginning. Instead of trying to remember a catalog of techniques, my higher goal is I don't want to be on my friggin' back. There's my higher goal. Now I have a situational problem. How do I implement a technique or a concept, a principle that will get me out of that situational problem? And you will see, boom, their their knowledge will just expand. Even if you are teaching some catalog of techniques, their knowledge base will expand. And then they'll do something. This is my favorite part. They will do something that they've never done before. And then they'll go, is that okay? And you're like, well, did you get up? Yeah. And they go, well, why wouldn't it be okay? <laughs> yeah. well, well, it wasn't something you taught. And I'm like, that's the point. Yeah. That's the point right there. Yeah. So yes, it's okay. You're, <coughs> you know, yeah. it was fun. I, we were doing a, a, a high, we were trying to get the kids really, really asked up. And I mean, we, we were doing it. We were using noise, strobes, obnoxious sounds. We would work them out a little bit. And then we were putting them in really stressful situations. And I'll never forget this one time. This girl was so, she was a fighter. So she's tough. She stayed in the fight, but she was getting overwhelmed. And and it was just to that point where she's like, I can't, I think I'm losing it. I think I'm losing it. I think I'm losing it. And I kid you not, it came to her mind. Her hand goes up the hockey pants and she checked his oil. (laughs) And man, I'll tell you what, that guy got off her so damn fast. She walks over and she goes, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, why are you sorry? And she goes, I, I couldn't think of anything else to do. So I just shoved my finger up his ass. And I'm like, did he get off? She goes, well, fuck yeah, he did. And I go, well, I ain't mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He's probably pretty pissed at you right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Not. 
<laughs> do I recommend it? No, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think I, I think uh, the problem is also is just these these kids are, are learning where if you do anything else, liability, you'll get sued, you'll go to jail, you'll do this, you'll do that. But you know, it, to me, when you're in the fight for your life, like sometimes you got to do certain things to be able to win. Like it, it is what it is. To me, it is what it is. But to to guys like us, it is what it is. But to people who oversee said training and all that they'll look at it like well that wasn't taught you know that wasn't a technique that was taught and that's there's the there's your disconnect yeah because the supreme court will use objective reasonableness but your agency will use politics i don't like that yeah these activists don't like that yeah and it's like okay but if is do we have the objective reasonable standard or not yeah because if you're saying that we should all do the same thing all the time then there is, then again, we go right back to it. Why does, why does competitive fighting have weight divisions? Yeah. Because size matters. Yeah. You are not going to teach a 130 pound female officer to fight like a 240 pound man. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. And if you, if, if you try to plant that in their heads, the only thing that's going to happen under the extremes is extreme valence and arousal. That's it. We're, we're not training for that. And if I, if you remember in the book, I go into, there's an artist share and a beholder's share of, yeah. of information. So when you look at a good piece of art and you're like, I love this piece of art, that's the beholder share. It's the reason you like it or don't like it. Even the people who go, oh my God, that's a piece of crap. The artist share is everything they put into it. Everything they made to make it something you either want to see or something you even hate. But there was something, a part of themselves they put into that. Yeah. Well, there's also what's called a fighter share. And the fighter share is, is, is what you developed for yourself. It's not what your coaches gave you. Yeah. They gave you the start point. They, they gave you the impetus. Now, what do you do with that information? Yeah. Yet the person who is going to judge you is always going to judge you from a beholder share. Yeah. It's this three inch and this 300 foot perspective. Yeah. If you only train at a three inch perspective, but are expected to perform at a 300 foot perspective, shit's not going your way. Yeah. Yet when you perform at the 300 foot perspective, you will be judged by people at the three inch perspective. Yeah. And that's an analogy I give to a lot of politicians. If I take a, a, a balance beam, a kid's balance beam, and I made it a little bit wider and I put it three inches off the ground, I say, I'll give you 50 bucks if you can walk 40 feet, stay on this balance beam. Very low risk, moderate reward. Everybody's going to do it. Yeah. But if I let you walk it for an hour and you did it every single time and I said, now, I'm going to give you $5 million to walk that same beam. But I'm going to put that beam 300 feet in the air. There is no safety net. Boom, go. Yep. There's going to be a whole big difference between how you walked it at three inches yeah. and how you walk it at 300 feet. Yeah. That's the difference between shooting a piece of paper on the range yeah. and shooting a human being who's trying to kill you. Because uh, you and I have done that. It's a completely different experience. Oh, no, it, it definitely is. Like, eh, there's no describing feelings like that. But so I know we're getting long on time. What I'd like to do uh, now that we're getting towards the end is if there's, you know, something that you want to share to the law enforcement community, civilians, veterans, you know, about literally tenacious resilience, you know, wh what would that kind of message be for them? for them to think about maybe tonight, tomorrow while they're on shift or even tonight, midnight, you know, for their shift, if there's anything you want to share. I think that, I think the biggest thing would be understand that everything the brain does is to keep you alive. The number one priority of the brain is reduce uncertainty and keep you alive to promulgate the species. That's, those are your, those are the key. I th I'm primal, sure they primal. Come the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? That yeah. comes with the program. Yeah. But understand that at the extremes of valence and arousal, the brain doesn't care about morality. It doesn't care about rules and regulations. So you have to understand that if you're not training to learn how to deal with that emotions, the valence and arousal that are the building blocks of your emotions, at the extremes, the brain only cares about you. It doesn't care about what's real, what's not real, what's really happening. It doesn't care. So if you think about it, and, and one of the best ways I've heard it put, I think it was Anil Seth who said it, the brain is running a controlled hallucination for you. Yeah. At extreme fear and arousal, the brain can run an uncontrolled hallucination for you. And the wallet he's reaching for, the phone he's reaching for, the drugs he wants to get rid of can easily be shown to you as a weapon. Because everything you think you see 
is simply a simulation run by your brain. Your eyes don't actually see anything. Yeah. Your brain interprets things. So I think that's it's it's the biggest cause of why we we form communities and we want to be part of something bigger. But it's also why it's so easy for us to hate each other based on politics, based on yeah. how people look, who they love. I mean, if you really start to understand the brain, when you start looking into it, understanding tenacity and resilience, you can start, I think, making that first step towards not being so quick to judge someone just because they happen to be, you're a moderate, they're an extreme liberal, or they're an extreme conservative. And instead of looking at it like, wow, this person's just a dipshit. Instead, <laughs> you can probably look at it and go, well, how? Do, I wonder how they got to where they're at. Yeah. I wonder what life circumstances got them there. And when you look at it that way, you maybe have a little bit more, just a little bit more, I, I don't know, empathy. So that you don't, you're not always looking to only be around people who are just like you. Yeah. Because that's a problem too. We, we get to where we're, and if you're not a teacher, especially, you will only associate with people like you. Yeah. And then if you're a teacher, away from teaching, you only want to associate with people like you. Yeah. I think that's a mistake because there's so much to learn out there, including from people who don't necessarily have a lot of degrees by their name. There's a lot of wisdom out there that you can learn from. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's one of the biggest things. One of the key findings for me about the brain is that it can show you things in order to make you do something for the sake of survival. And that's, uh, that's pretty damn dangerous in our profession. And then the number one way of working with that is, again, getting back to that idea of accepting the fact that I want to learn to deal with desirable difficulties. I want to seek difficulties and make it part of the equation where my brain just goes, OK, I don't have the answer. But yeah, we've done this before. We've worked through problems before. There's yeah. a good chance we're going to work through this one. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. And, and it, it's a great way of uh, of explaining, you know, basically just what it is about i mean you you know you've, you've written three books and, and each book seems to be like a build off the other you know and, yes. and you know so so it, to me reading your books it literally was that it was like i was reading different stages i guess i'll call it right the different stages of 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 the thought process behind you know what what you are teaching and, and what you're talking about and especially when it comes to the neuroscience and your you know stress responses and um and I mean, uh, for people to get the book, uh, to read, uh, is it Amazon? Yeah, this new book is just on Amazon. So okay. it's, uh, we've, we've worked through all distribution stuff. It's available. It's ready. All right, perfect. So uh, then what I'll do is I'll add the uh, the uh, Amazon link in the show notes for everybody. That way they can order it. Uh, do you know if it's available Kindle and stuff like that? Is that is that uh, an option too? Yeah, it's available on uh, the uh, the paperback book, and it's available also on Kindle. Okay. I have not done the uh, um, the, uh, the iBooks. Book. Oh, the, oh, the, the, the audio, the, the audio book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. may get to the point where I put them on audio, yeah. but uh, I would have to find someone with a better voice. Although some <laughs> of my former students are like, "God, we want to hear you. We want to yeah. hear you put your <laughs> into it." So I might have to do two versions of that book. But, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Hey, have someone uh, sound like Barry White read your book, or maybe Morgan that's, Freeman, right? <laughs> Morgan Freeman. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. That'd be awesome. Dude. Oh man, that'd be amazing. Connor McGregor, just for kicks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you really want to listen, yeah. Oh man, that'd be awesome. But uh, Mike, hang out for a second. Let me do a, a quick outro, and we'll we'll talk for a minute offline before you go. All right, man. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for uh, coming on again, sharing your wisdom. I mean, like you said, just. You know, there's a lot of people out there without uh, some fancy degrees and alphabets that just really know their shit. And and it's this is like you know, uh, reading you know people uh, books from you and uh, and others. You really see the wisdom because that wisdom is uh, real life knowledge versus academia and studying. Right? It's it's it, it's a little different. You know what I'm talking about when it, when I say that. So, uh, everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you got uh, uh, something out of this. Uh, like I said, uh, order Mike's book. Actually, all, order all, all three because uh, they really do work in parts. And, uh, and that way you get to uh, read his thoughts and his, uh, his methods. It's, it's, it, these things are really good. But, uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, we couldn't be here without our supporters, sponsors. Um, go to AAA Police Supply, uh, 
order whatever you want for law enforcement and uh, make sure you use the coupon code hybrid 10 to get 10 percent off your entire order and uh, same thing go to habit journal if you want to read uh, any of my uh, work any of my articles that i've written or even uh, order uh, book that was published by the second mission foundation that i wrote uh, go on amazon i'll also put that in the show links uh actually it's usually on my instagram page you can just go there and go from there but uh everyone uh, other than that stay safe stay safe talk to you soon